Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is uh, one of the last uh, panels of the afternoon, and I'm actually so encouraged to see that there's barely an open seat for this. <laughs> and uh, it's terrific to see everybody here. And uh, we're going to jump right into it because we don't have a whole lot of time, but this is uh, a significant and important topic uh, for us here at Web Summit. I want to kick this off with, with, a, with a question to Claire. You heard her bio and her background. But uh, Cl Claire, so the organization you run was founded in response to a fundamental problem at the heart of efforts to eradicate extreme poverty. The problem that your organization identified is that there's often unreliable or even non-existent data and the lack of skills and or the willingness among some to even actually be data-based or data-driven. Can you give us a sense of what's happening here within the ecosystem that would contribute to this? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I think we all learned during the process of trying to achieve the Millennium Development Goals is how absolutely central data is to trying to do that. And that goes double for the Sustainable Development Goals, which, of course, is a much bigger and more complicated agenda. So you can't run an effective universal healthcare program, for example, unless you know where people live, who, when they're born, what people are dying from, and that helps you to allocate the money that you need to run your health service in the right way. Now, a surprising and enormous number of countries don't have that basic facts about, about, their, um, about their populations. They don't know who's born. They don't know what people are dying from. And without that kind of basic information, it just makes the job of achieving the Sustainable Development Goals that much harder. So what, what are some of the best efforts, though, that you've seen around some that, that truly are data-driven and they, they prioritize the use of data? I think what we're at a really exciting moment because we've kind of got this great combination at the moment of governments who are really wanting to solve this problem and recognizing they have to invest in data, they have to try out new ways of getting the information that they need to achieve the outcomes that their citizens want. And also, of course, we're seeing, as we've been all hearing about all day today, some of these amazing innovations and technological developments that allow that to happen. So, for example, one of the projects that we're involved in in Ghana is putting together the data that we all generate every day, most of you are doing it now, with our mobile phones. Um, and use it, putting that together, so the data the, from, from Ghana's millions of mobile phone users, and processing that and making that available to the government, obviously appropriately anonymized, so they can see how people are moving around the country and allocate the services accordingly. So it's really started, so the new technology is really starting to solve some of these old problems. So if you go to enough of these, these sessions here, you'll hear some, some contrasting point of views. And among some, they, they see that, uh, or they understand technology to be the solution. And so they would come to this conversation on the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs, and view tech as, as the primary solution to achieve these SDGs. In some other cases, uh, you know, they see it as simply one tool among many. Uh, to help to, uh, to address it. And I'm interested on the panel to get people's views around, um, is it important to make that kind of distinction? And, uh, and, and if you think it is, why is that important to have a distinction between tech as sort of the solution versus tech as one tool among many? Hmm. Who wants to take that first? Oh, go ahead, Paul. I'm good. I, I, personally, I don't think, I, I mean, th there's obviously a distinction between the two. I think both are true. It's a solution and it's a tool depending on what the application of it is. Um, so both are needed in, uh, in large quantity, um, but I don't really think the distinction between the two is terribly important. Claire. I mean, I disagree slightly. I think it is quite important. Obviously, there are... Tr there are cases in which both are true but i've seen a lot of projects where technology you know where people have started with the technology and invented some really cool thing which is amazing but which actually doesn't solve a real problem or which isn't meeting a need that somebody has or which is completely inappropriate for the context so i think you do ideally 
have to start with the problem that you're trying to solve and then work out which technology is the tool to do that. I'm slightly, or I think sometimes we fall into the trap of just loving something because it's cool and they are very cool, but they often don't actually contribute very much in the real world. Yes, Nadim. Sure, so I'm gonna offer maybe a slightly more extreme view on this, which is uh, technology sometimes can be a distraction from the hard work that needs to be done in this space. Uh, so really, they, I mean, there's several pieces to the hard work, but one of them is winning the hearts and minds of everybody on the planet, of every company, as Janina will, will, will tell us, every community. And that's sometimes sort of, you know, we shy away from that in the hope that somehow there is a technological solution that will get us there. And I think we do that at our own peril. Well, l l let me ask, though, is there w what it, it, it seems that tech biases towards a certain way of thinking, right? Or, if I can be even more provocative, even certain kinds of people, and there's a bias. How do you mitigate that? Because many of the people that um, are among the communities of which the SDGs are working uh, don't have access to technology, don't have the capacity required to be able to use it. And how do we mitigate this bias that seems to exist? Who wants to pick that up? That's an easy one. So. <laughs> That's an easy one. Okay, Claire, <laughs> to you. <laughs> or I think, Janina. <laughs> I think, you know, we're all sort of learning as we go along here. And I think like any complicated problem, what you need is to bring lots of quite different sets of skills and different types of people to bear to solve it. So I think part of mitigating that bias is, is, is produce is um, getting the right groups of people together who have quite different sets of skills. I mean, I do think you're, there's a sort of broader point about the bias which is created by the inequalities that we see in access to technology and whether some people just haven't sort of understand technology and have an opportunity to express their demands through technology and other people don't. I think that's a broader question about digital inclusion. But in terms of this sort of question of always reaching for the techie first um, solution, I think the answer to that lies really in collaboration and just listening to the points of view of people that are coming from very different perspectives. Nadim, do you want to come in? Uh, yeah. Actually, there's a positive bias, in spite of what I said earlier about technology, okay. which is actually it's easier to engage the young people with technology, so there's an inherent bias where, where the digital access is, is present to be engaging with the young people through technology. And I think that's a very positive thing because, you know, uh, I think we need the, not just the, the voice, but we need the power of the young people to make decisions yeah. in relation to these issues. Paul, I want to I want to call out to you on this question. Uh, prior to Change X, you helped to stand up Ashoka across Europe, and Ashoka is this amazing organization that really identifies new startups and social entrepreneurs around the world, and uh, and it does it around um, social impact projects. That typically is the Ashoka Fellow model. Just from your experience, having worked in Ashoka now with Change X, your broad view that you have uh, across the world, where do you think there's opportunities for innovation that might be particularly interesting for the tech community or, or even more broadly than the tech community? What kind of innovation do you see out there that would be unique to uh, the development of the SDGs? The SDG, yeah, like I, I, I got introduced to the original kind of Millennium Development Goals maybe around 2003 or 2004. Uh, before that, I didn't have a conscience. And uh, so, <laughs> but, but it, it just felt like it was a very small niche brigade of people that were kind of behind them. And what I think is exciting about the Sustainable Development Goals is that it's engaging a much broader uh, cohort of people from different sectors, different age groups, different geographies. And it's very exciting to have, you know, these kind of high level goals that people can unite behind. And it's relevant, like, it's relevant to everybody's work in some shape or form, so everybody can find their role within it. So I think the thing, the, uh, the opportunity I think that's uh, most exciting is the power of the crowd and really mobilizing uh, a, a movement behind the deliverance of the goals across sectors, but all the way down to local mm -hmm. communities, citizen-led execution. And uh, so that's, I think, 
one of the big opportunities, both in terms of people's talent, but also their financial resources, their creative uh, ideas and whatnot. So uh, that's the biggest opportunity I'm excited yeah. about. Uh, let me push you a little bit on that. We, we're, we're here with some of the top venture capitalists right around the world. I've always felt like the, the um, financial capital markets, if you will, philanthropy and charitable support, many of those are the financial instruments that, for example, Ashoka Fellows are dependent upon, and it seems pretty dysfunctional. And how, you know, do you have any thoughts about how, how we begin to change or transform financial capital markets such that resources are made available to people who are on the front lines of innovation here that, you know, may not now be able to get in front of a venture capitalist? Yeah, like, I, I, I'm not an expert in this area, but I have a view. Um, good, good. So... If you think about how nonprofits spread currently, like if you were to go onto any nonprofit website, you wouldn't find pricing, right? So you wouldn't actually know how much a unit of their idea costs. Now, th they know what it costs because there's a cost, but there's no pricing. So you can't actually buy the impact. So I if you think about that from a marketplace of ideas perspective, there's no transparency around the product or price. So that eBay, um, is a perfect example of a yeah. marketplace that gives transparency to those things. But if you can introduce uh, pricing, you can introduce sustainability for nonprofits that funders can pay for. Funders of all shapes and sizes, it could be the crowd, it could be government, it could be corporates. And if you create this kind of um, sustainable uh, uh, model that nonprofits can pursue, then it's much more attractive to private capital. Whether it's as a social impact bond that's underwriting this impact, or whether it's like just straight up uh, providing different forms of capital. Like, there's no tech VC here that's gonna be in investing in a not-for-profit in the way they do a for-profit with 10X return and whatnot. That's not gonna happen. But there's different, you know, th there's, th there, there's all kinds of financial instruments being innovated. Uh, uh, that's true. In, in pursuit of the goals, and there has to be because there's an enormous amount of resources required to achieve them. So, as I said, I'm not an expert, but that area of like pricing and creating a transparent marketplace is something that we're working on ourselves. That's great. Right. Can I Co piggyback come in, on this and again yeah. offer perhaps a, maybe a contrarian view, which is where I don't see government being as much part of this conversation as it needs to be. So. We're not going to get anywhere on the SDGs without governments beginning to operate in a different way. And so it's not, we can't delegate this out to nonprofits or venture capitalists or philanthropists. I mean, ultimately, governments need to do government differently to get there. And I think it's what Paul mentioned earlier about building a movement at the local level. Frankly, government needs to become, get in the business of building local movements because that's what's going to take yeah you know claire i want to pull you in on this one because you sort of you sit at that intersection with the u.n and a lot of uh, government bodies uh ar around the world and even here in portugal i was just talking to some folks yesterday this is a very this is an, a topic that is at the forefront of a lot of thinking in portugal in ways in which i apologize is not in the u.s and so you know what do you have a a counter view to to Nadim's on this? Not really. I mean, uh, disappointingly, sorry, I feel I should offer some third contrarian view now. But <laughs> um, I mean, I very much agree that, that governments are the sort of central actors here. I mean, I think also too often we slightly fall into a trap. I don't know if it's just some way in which we're hardwired to think or something about kind of thinking there can only ever be one solution or one key actor at a time. So I would say, you know, the point is governments are absolutely central, but that doesn't mean that the private sector or civil society are less important. It just means that they have different roles. And I think in the area of, you know, coming back to, to my favorite subject, in the area of data, you can see how the ability to use, for example, data from the private sector for achieving the SDGs is actually dependent on, first of all, having good data from the public sector. So in the example I used before of using um, sort of mobile phone records to track poverty and track move people's movements, you can only really do that if you've got the bedrock of a good census to build on. So it's actually, you know, you need the government investment to be able to leverage the private sector investment, 
but also the fact of having the opportunity to leverage that private sector investment means you get more bang for your buck in the public sector investment as well. So the census data becomes even more valuable because not only could it do all the things that it could do before, but it can now also help you to do all these new things with mobile phone data, with Earth observation, with the data that we get from satellites, with all kinds of other things. So it's actually increasing the value of public sector assets as well as private sector assets through bringing them together like that. Maybe I can ask them, um, come in, something um, from a business perspective. I think this sustainability game is a game we can just play all together. So we need the government with the right regulations. So because as long as sustainability is just on a voluntary base, we never will reach the impact we need to really create solution for this world. We need businesses who really are creative and innovative and do the next steps um, within the different sectors. But we also need the society because we, we cannot forget or we shouldn't forget that companies just move if they have to or if, it's the, the, if there is a big demand from their clients. So the society as a whole and every individual as a consumer, as an employee, as a, as a parent, as a friend should um, try to find his own or her own part of the whole responsibility. And then if all these, these different levels start working towards the right direction, then I guess we have a chance to come a step forward. But it would be the wrong message if you say, OK, the government needs to start, or businesses needs to start, or the society, because it just will work if everybody goes toward the right but it, it, it seems like we're in the midst of, I, I, from my point of view, we're in the midst of, of a significant change you know, around issues of sustainability and the like within the commercial private sector business community. Um, I just watch the way in which, um, you know, my, uh, my adult children now make consumption choices in ways that I didn't make at their age. And they're interested about sustainability. They want to know how it was made, where it comes from, what's in their products. And so something seems to be changing theirs in ways in which it could really scale the SDGs. But how, how might we accelerate that? You know, how do we, how do we um, what's the behavior change from focusing solely on profit more towards purpose and sustainability uh, that's required from the commercial sector? I mean, the first part is a, is a society point, and I'm, I'm really happy. I see the same development like Lou. I'm happy that the next generations are more focused on sustainability. And the second part of your questions is really business-oriented. And I guess the biggest problem we actually face is a mindset problem with sustainability. Because nowadays, companies, they have their core strategy with their core products and core services, and technology is an integrated part in it. So. Um, they really focus on profitability and next to it as an add-on they have uh, their sustainability strategy But normally in most of the cases it's not an integrated part in their business model So they do not use their core competences for finding solutions for all the challenges we face It's it's really a separated um, part of the company and as long as we focus on the separation and do not find solution how profitability and, and sustainability can along together, and there are solutions for that, um, we will not achieve the maximum impact we really need to have yeah. a change. And therefore, if we go on like now, it will be really hard, in my opinion, to achieve the SDGs. And um, just if we find solutions um, to integrate it, then we can have the change we need. Paul. Yeah, I, I'm uh, particularly struck by the shift in the corporate sector as well. Um, I worked at both Unilever and Cadbury when I graduated, oh. and uh, this is like about 15 years ago, and Unilever are now like the beacons, but they were nowhere 15 years ago. I mean, they, there was no sustainability strategy whatsoever, and it all came down to the, the leadership of Paul Palman and, and others within the company to drive it. But in, in, in those instances of Unilever and Cadbury, they actually acquired small sustainable companies in Ben and & Jerry's and Greens and & Blacks and companies like that. And these small companies within these big multinationals actually had quite an influence on the kind of values and culture and, and whatnot. And, and I think the, the second big driver will be the, the generation shift within these big corporates. You know, the, the millennials are looking for purposeful places to work. If you've got some bullshit CSR strategy that's meaningless, you're going to get called out. People will leave your company. So, so people have to figure out how to, and it is complex. Like I was just with Target a couple of days ago, and they're moving from old CSR 
tag on to integrating it all the way through a very complex supply chain. And it's a huge undertaking. You know, it's uh, very complex to do it, but it's essential to achieving the, uh, the likes of the sustainable development goals. It needs to be all the way through these organizations. So do you think that presents a competitive advantage in, in, the, in the marketplace? And Most definitely. You even think about talent in the U.S. The recent labor numbers come out was uh, unemployment is somewhere around 4.5%, which labor economists will tell you is essentially full employment. And um, uh, talent now can make choices where they want to work, you know, in ways in, that are unique. And so is it a competitive advantage? Yes, I think so. It's, a, it's an advantage for new employees, but also in the market for your strategic positioning. So, uh -huh. I mean, nowadays the demand from beside of consumers, employees, also investors, but also from competitors. So if one of your competitors starts to being effective with sustainability, not just CSR or philanthropy, really effective in his core strategy. Um, this has a huge impact on your own con con um, organizations. And because of the new generation, we really ask even more for sustainable companies, sustainable products, sustainable startups. This will be a huge driver in the future um, for companies to have their um, standalone position and it will be a play that goes on and on and on and yeah. hopefully most of the company will be sustain sustainable and we have to talk about the ones who aren't as a few ones and not as today and we uh, live happily ever after. after yeah well i wish we could exactly. talk about the ones that aren't but i think we're going to run out of time claire i mean just to, to briefly talk about the ones that aren't, I mean, I think this is great, and I think you're right, there's been this revolution in s many companies, and that's fantastic. The thing that worries me about this reliance on the market and on consumer preferences is all of those companies that we've never heard of. You know, it's, if you're Unilever and you're consumer facing, it really matters. If you're producing the widgets that Unilever is using to run their software, Nobody knows you exist. Your vote, you can be a huge company. Nobody can know you'll never feel that sort of consumer pressure. So I think what we need to see here and what we've always seen, you know, if you think about the revolution in, say, employment practices that have happened over the last 100, 200 years in Europe, you know, 200 years ago, we were sending children up chimneys. Now we're not. And that's because of this kind of positive virtuous circle that's created between consumer pressure, public change and then regulation. And it's the way that these things can kind of build on each other, I think, which ultimately is the answer to bringing all companies along behind those market, those leaders. You know, I actually want to take a little bit of a pivot here and talk about sort of the role of connecting, collaboration, and more broadly defined sort of these, these platform companies that are emerging at scale. And the great thing about Web Summit is you can walk in here and see the co-founder of, of uh, Facebook, you know, sipping a cappuccino, right, by himself. And that's the great thing that, that Web Summit presents is these individuals. And it seems like these platform environments are introducing something uh, that is unique in the 21st century around connection, collaboration at scale. So, of course, we, we've had collaboration and connection, but perhaps not at the levels of scale that we're achieving now. Paul, I want to come back to you and ChangeX. We talked about this a little bit a moment ago. ChangeX is a, is a marketplace of ideas and a platform for communities to organize. How, how for you at ChangeX and what you're seeing elsewhere is technology enabling that kind of engagement, collaboration, and outreach? Yeah, so um, what we're trying to do is take ideas that work in one place and spread them to other places that, where they find the ideas are relevant because there's an awful lot of wasteful reinvention happening or indeed no solution at all. So uh, as we were looking at like, how do you most effectively disseminate ideas that are already proven to work, we tested loads of different channels and Facebook was by far the most effective uh, channel, Facebook ads specifically. Hmm. And the reason being, they have a social graph of people's demographics and interests, you know, a couple of billion users. So if you're trying to get a coding club for kids going, you can target the mother of a couple of young kids who has an interest in technology. And you can ask her if she'd be interested in getting something like this going in her community via the Facebook platform. So, you know, the, 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 the speed at which ideas spread in the sector that I'm familiar with, like say the social entrepreneurship space, ideas spread very slowly relative to the opportunity that platforms like Facebook uh, represent. So this wasn't possible before Facebook. Hmm. You know, you, you just didn't have this dissemination capability. So now, you know, you, you, 
it, it should be possible within maybe five years to blitz scale, to global scale, new ideas, you know, within a year or two. That used to take decades if they ever got to global scale at all. So the speed at which you can just disseminate things, I think, is, um, is hugely powerful. So that's just one example. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, actually, we want to open it up for questions here in a couple of moments. I'm going to engage the panel, and so be thinking of your questions. And I know we have some microphones around, and they'll they'll seek you out. And uh, <laughs> but if you have questions, I'll open it up in a moment. I, I want I want to ask you, uh, you know, Paul and the rest. You know that this this particular example that you provided. It, you know, I apologize. I'm from the states, and I think the U.S. was uh, well, at least one of our. White House officials introduced the idea of alternative facts, which I'm not quite sure what that is. I'm still struggling to understand what an alternative fact is. But nonetheless, there has been a lot of question around, uh, uh, you know, if you, can, if you can trust the integrity of what you read and see and hear. And how, how in this kind of platform environment or otherwise, can we really check the integrity of data, of uh, the kind of participation that's taking place on the platforms that you call out, Paul, it seems really important, particularly among the SDGs. Uh, how, how do we mitigate that? Claire, do you have any thoughts on this? I mean, I think what we've seen, and Facebook is a good example of that, it's a bit of an overturning of the way that we used to do it. It used to be that the way that we check facts was just by sort of checking that everyone else thought that they were facts. And that became a kind of set of received wisdoms in society for, you know, some of them true, some of them social norms that change over time. But the, the whole kind of experience of Facebook and the bubbles that are created means that you can be in a world where you can have a whole group of people around you who are seeing something as a fact and in fact it turns out not to be quite the opposite and I think that's the danger that the sort of the social mechanisms that used to work to check facts are now somewhat broken and that's exactly the problem I mean I think there is alas no quick fix to this we talk a lot about data literacy which is a slightly off-putting technical term but I think for me it means people becoming as confident about numbers as people are about words. You know, it drives me mad when people go, oh, I can't do maths, oh, well, I can't do numbers. You know, I don't think that's really an option anymore. And I think we have to just stop being, seeing data as some sort of scary thing out there and just see it as data, just like words, just like a photograph, just like a painting, is just a way of describing the world and the people in it. It is us. All data collection starts with a conversation or with some human relationship. And so I think we have to sort of humanize data and be less scared of it and just start to see it in the same way as we see everything else. But I don't think there's any magic answer to alternative facts, unfortunately. I actually think this is a second order problem that we're not yet, we don't need to deal with in this space. So dissemination is great. I worry more about what happens after dissemination is there adoption? Because, you know, practices, uh, most practices are useful, but they need to be adopted. So I don't, so if it worked somewhere, it's good to put it out there. But the question is, how do you create the context for traction? And, and not worry too much about whether they were lying about whether it worked in Ghana or not. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, but, uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't think Facebook can create that environment, but you can connect. Yes. You can connect the, with the right people who are the ones most inclined to Absolutely. activating the ideas. And you can create movements, to your point. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, uh, just to your point, again, not, not an area of expertise, one of, our, one of our backers, he's an Irish entrepreneur called Mark Little. And uh, Mark founded Storyful, then went in to be the head of Twitter in Europe. Oh. And he and a, a former colleague of his, Anya Kerr, who was the head of news and journalism at Facebook, are starting a new... Uh, a new platform that's aiming to provide uh, the, the, the kind of stra short line is like it's the Netflix for news. So trying to provide a more curated experience of news so that um, you can kind of cut through the noise a little bit, you know, uh, that exists on platforms like Facebook and Twitter um, and trying to get to the truth uh, a bit more on matters. So I think the whole, there's a big opportunity to just create the unbelievable amounts of information that are coming at us all the time. And of course, those platforms themselves will have to improve mm. at weeding out the fake stuff. And they will. I mean, it's relatively early in their life cycle. You know, 
yeah. the, the amount of information that's been published there all the time, they just, it's hard to control. They're going to have to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, perfect. You know, actually, we just have almost a couple of minutes left here. Let me just do a scan and see if there's any questions uh, that anybody might have. Here on the front row, it looks like, and then we have one in the back. So let's pick up here a gentleman on the front row. And... Um, Thanks. Adrian Lovett from the Web Foundation. Um, I wonder what the panel think about, if we all agree that filter bubbles are a, are a problem, or largely a problem, um, in that they reinforce uh, partial and sometimes uh, objectively incorrect uh, non-facts, uh, is the answer more to try to expose people to objective facts or to other people's truths, if you see what I mean? There might be a difference. Yeah. It's a great question. Who would like to pick that up? Uh, and I defer to you, Claire, on this one. <laughs> am, I, am I becoming the truth lady on this panel? Um, I mean, I think yes to both. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily see them as, uh, as being mutually exclusive. I think objective facts, and that's what I was saying about data literacy, people need to know, feel, feel more confident handling facts so they're not only reliant on other people's truths, but on the other hand, uh, there are some things which are not, you know, which are somewhat fuzzy, and the, you know, there are some things which are objective facts where you can say, you know, you have a blue shirt on, that's a fact. There are other things that are a bit fuzzier, and where we do have to rely on a kind of social consensus around something. And so I kind of think it's a bit of both. Okay, we're going to keep moving along here. We have a question in the back, and then uh, we'll come to the front row. It's not on. Joe obviously by Symington Family Estates wine producer. I'm just curious because uh, when I was young, a kid, whenever I needed information, I'd go to an encyclopedia and it would be a fact. Today, I need information, I go to the net and the first thing that normally pops up is Wikipedia. Wikipedia is full of mistakes. I mean, the thing has a lot of mistakes. Any of us can introduce data and change the data and so on and so forth. I think that the fact is, and I think you mentioned that, Claire, that we have to be a lot more critical about the data we see on the net when we're searching for things, and we have to analyze it and think, I mean, does this really make sense? Uh, this is just, a, I mean, a statement of fact, and I would like to hear your comments on it. Oh, thank you. That's uh, such an important su uh, s point, you know, and <laughs> I think you're completely right, but I think that information in encyclopedias was also always partial. You know, there were encyclopedias written in the 19th century which said that the British Empire was a wonderful, fantastic thing and was bringing peace and safety to the world. Of, you know, so I think there was always things that were wrong in encyclopedias too. <laughs> okay, we're going to come to the front row. We have time, just about out of, out of time for one last question here. Thank you. Uh, Caroline de Bruin, uh, run a startup called Sea Change. Um, you're, we've made a, f a few very important points around transparency, around collaboration, around fragmentation, market efficiency. What we've seen with our startup, where we analyze over 200 platforms, for your point, yeah. that are all trying to contribute. Um, what we've seen is a lack of tech leadership on the accountability side, on the orchestration side, and inter interoperability side. Wondering if the panel recognizes that challenge and if the, even summits like this have a role to play in really leaping into a next uh, world of tech leadership. Okay, we have time for one response before this blinking light shoots us off the platform. Uh. Any thoughts here? I would say yes, yes, and yes on this <laughs> one. Absolutely. And with 50,000 people attending something like Web Summit, I, I'm encouraged to see that Web Summit has introduced this conversation. We just want to see Web Summit take it to scale because I think it could be very, very influential. Listen, folks, please join me in thanking our panelists today. I'm sure they'll be milling around if you have additional questions. Thank you so much. Thank you.